Add it in. Uh, all of it is very helpful, and we are very thankful for it as well. Right. What a great way to impact the kingdom. So we are glad that we had time with you today. And right now, we're going to get ready for worship and transition over to our service host. All right. Good morning, Gate Church. All of you on campus, how are you today? Come on, let me hear you a little bit better than that. How are you today? Why don't you stand to your feet? All of you are online, all our family online today. Welcome to a day of celebration. And let's just begin by lifting our hands. If you're on campus here with us, lift our hands together. We're going to enter into a time of worship. If you're online with us today, why don't you just set your heart right wherever you're at. There's never a better time than right now just to set your mind on the Lord. Just lift up your voice with me. If you're here today, if you're online, why don't you just lift your voice, maybe even in the chat box there. You can just shout to the Lord. Say, thank you, Jesus. Lord, we lift our voice to you today. We create a place for the worship now. I just want to take a moment and set an atmosphere. Will you just join me? We worship you, Lord. We lift our voice in praise today. Oh, let the Spirit of the Lord arise in the house of God. Let the people of the Lord worship together today. Lord, we thank you today, God, because you're good. Your mercy endures forever. Lord, there's not a day we've been without you. There's not a season, Lord, we've gone without you. How can the people of God speak in faith this morning and declare that when I was down, you lifted me up. When I was discouraged, Lord, you filled my life with joy. If you're online today, you just remember that moment where you were desperate. Maybe that's today. We remind ourselves that there's no God like our God. But we celebrate together. We sing together. So amazing, so amazing you 
this morning you're our defender you are the most high king come on raise your voice and say great Jehovah ruler of everything yes Lord that's who you are this morning you're our defender you are the most high king come on can we just do it right here let's put some pressure on it wide as the sky we lift your name on high today there's nobody like you you're so faithful you're so amazing and we worship you this morning hallelujah hallelujah yes Lord we love you Jesus Hey. 
declare that in this house this morning. Let all the other names
a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ. My Come on, somebody sing it out this morning. Say. What a beautiful name.
situation. He is Lord. He's Lord of all. No matter what the doctor may say, he is Lord. He's Lord of all. Hallelujah. 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 Would you put your hands right where you're standing right there? You know, one thing the church has to learn to do is even when you don't feel like it, you press in anyways. Some people feel like this moment is an attack on your life. There's nothing else that can go wrong. But the church has to learn to worship in the middle of a trial. That's part of becoming the church. It's when I begin to express my confession that might not match my situation, but I know in whom I faith today. It is in Christ alone. He is the cornerstone of my building. He is the cornerstone of my foundation. What does that mean? It means he is the truth above all other truths. All things that claim to be true have to bow their knee to the one singular truth and his name is Jesus. And the church in this moment has to learn to worship and press in. You say, I'm waiting for emotion. You'll be waiting forever. I'm waiting That's all right. That is great. We love you today. Wherever you're joining us, we consider you a critical part of this family. Reaching, the, we get the message of Jesus spreading to our city, our states, our nations around the world. We really have international guests today joining us that are that we're serving together, but we are all are the body of Christ. So if you're in the campus today or on campus, you want to turn around, do a little bump of the fist or an air high five, do that. We just want to make sure we just kind of maintain some distancing there. If you're online, we love you today. We have our hosts that are going to join us uh, in just a moment. But let us know where you're from so we can say hi to you. God bless you for joining us today. We are in love with our online family. We're going to move this service along real quick. We've got a couple of special folks joining us. Y'all recognize this lady right here? 
Pastor Kathy, I just want to say she's got some several things to share, but Pastor Kathy, we want to say to you today that your heart of serving and loving our city is really the heartbeat of this house, and you lead us in that. Pastor Kathy, as of you have been around our church for a while, know that it is her heart to get into the broken places of people's lives and speak hope and faith. She's done that for any of us who've been around her for any time because we've all had moments of brokenness. But she leads that. She's the heartbeat of that in this house. And we follow your lead. And so they're going to share today. But can you give our pastor a hand clap of thanks and encouragement? We love her today. Come on, why don't you stand to your feet and just tell her how much you love her. We love you, PK. Thank you for serving us today. Thank you so much. You may be seated. It's so good to be back. So thankful for your prayers and for uh, for God touching my body and coming through surgery and all that good stuff. But I'm so thankful. Thank you so much. It's good to see you. It's good to stand on the platform again and look at our Gate Church family and people that I know and people that I don't know. So if you, it's your first time here, we want to welcome you to the Gate Church this morning. And we're so thankful you're here. And this is... <laughs> Oh, say that again. The amazing Pastor Kathy. <laughs> say it one more time. Oh, I'm just teasing. Uh, can you tell my husband? Bishop, the yeah. amazing, the amazing, the amazing Pastor Kathy. Come on, everybody. The that's amazing good, that's good. Pastor no. Kathy. <laughs> we're just teasing. Anyway, we're just so thankful that we have the opportunity, Malachi and I, and he's him and his wife, Melissa, are actually overseeing our city reach now. And so we're thankful for that. And how many know we just come alongside people like Malachi that are learning and have never uh, done this quite like we've done it before? And he's just been so willing, and him and Melissa, as we walk together through this journey. And so I'm so thankful. Thank you today for bringing your bags back full of groceries. How, how, who would have ever known that we wouldn't have power for two weeks? I mean, many of you were in the very same situation. And so the church didn't have any power. And all, how many know it's just been the, kind of the year of disruptions? Like the things you thought you were going to do. And we came and stapled all those little things onto those bags. And if we'd have known all that, if God would have told us that, we wouldn't even bother. You know, but God knows and he's faithful. And so why don't you tell us what's going on there? So thank you once again for everybody that brought your bags back. I think we have a team right now that's retrieving most of those. But I wanted to tell you, uh, Gate Church congregation and those that are watching online, we still have plenty of time for you to get your bags. And if you weren't able to bring it today, um, we have, uh, we've been partnering with Walmart. So you can go to walmart.com. and the, we are, The Walmart on this Northwest Expressway. Right. Northwest Expressway and Council is the Walmart that we have designated. So you can order your uh, groceries for pickup or delivery. We have a team ready to pick those yes. up every day up until when, Pastor Kathy? Well, the, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, yeah. we're going to be available to you to pick up groceries at the Walmart right here on Northwest Expressway. So you said might say, you know what, I didn't get a bag. It's just a little hard for me to do what I need to do right now. Yeah. But you can go online. Get our, get our uh, list that we need for Thanksgiving and we'll help us fill a bag. You can do that. And if you'll put your name, so I would put my name, Kathy Miller, slash City Reach. Slash City Reach. And when you do that, the people that we go to pick up will know that this is for City Reach and we'll have a badge on and they'll know exactly who we are. And then you can let us know by calling the church office or you can let us know by going on our Facebook page, uh, the Gate Church family, hey, I did this and there, my, my uh, groceries are ready to be picked up at 10 a.m. We will have a team there that will pick up your groceries and bring them back here to be able to put in our boxes for Thanksgiving. So how cool is that? And so we're so thankful for that. So you might be that person. Please let us know so we can get there. The key to it is though, you have to have City Reach with your name you have to have that otherwise they will not know they'll think we're stealing somebody's groceries and we don't want to go to jail or anything like that right that would not be good that would not, that be, would good. not be good and so uh, we're so thankful that we have that opportunity and in that i want to announce today there's many people that are in our body and that might need a family meal this year you might be one of those people or you might know someone that needs a family meal
If that's you this morning, we always want to do our household of faith people first. And so today, if that might be you, you can sign up in the back. There's a, a place where you can sign up for your name. We need your email address. We need your information. We will get back to you exactly the time that you can come pick up your Thanksgiving basket. That, you know, and sometimes things just happen. And sometimes you just need a little help to kind of get you over the hump, and that's okay. And you might want to say, there's other people that are joining us online today. You can also go to the Gate Church, where's it at? GateChurch.tv Thanksgiving, and you can fill out your form right there if you're online with us today. So isn't that great? Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be able to give back. And you make that happen. And you might say, well, I don't want to do online or I don't want to do groceries, but I'll give you money. We take that too. We'll shop for you. So if you want to uh, go online and give to City Reach, you can do that as well. And I know I need to hurry, but, you know, these, th these things happen. Um, <laughs> where am I nice at on my list? <laughs> okay, this box, we have had the most wonderful opportunity to partner with Samaritan's Purse this year and be able to put toys in this box. We have 22 boxes that are available to us. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we have 22 boxes that are available. Well, really 21, because this is mine. Yeah, I'm sorry, this is, this is Pastor Kathy's. <laughs> um, we have 22 boxes available in Samaritan. 21. 21, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You see, I'm melting up here. It's hard to play drums and then join You're Pastor sweating. Kathy. <laughs> No, um, we have 20, 21 boxes, and Samaritan's Purse, they distribute over 10 million of these boxes worldwide every year. Every year, 10 million boxes go to children, uh, toys, hygiene products, school supplies, uh, things that are gold to them, for those of you that have traveled abroad. So that is going to be available today also. Yes, it'll be available out in the portico. And the wonderful thing about this, which I love, is that we will give you a list of what goes in the box. They want you to put a picture of your family, or if it's just you individually, they want you to write a letter. And the beauty of all this is, is that you get to follow your box online wherever it goes in the world. Right. Right. So this is a wonderful opportunity for you and your children to fill a box for someone, another child across wherever this box might go, and they get to watch exactly where it goes. And so, you know, we, we usually have a little bit more time to be able to do something like this, but somebody contacted us that, hey, we have these 22 boxes, would the gate church like to, to do it? And I was like, I know we can do that. That's just 22 boxes, we got this. Yeah. So we need to have these boxes back by next Sunday. So if you would like on the 22nd, right, that's next Sunday, and we need to have them back. There will be an area out here, a City Reach box of bin that you can put your boxes in. You can pick a boy or a girl. This, we have all the information for you. And so would you help us today? Can we get these 22 boxes, 21 boxes uh, done and brought back on next Sunday? Thank you so much. I'm so excited about that. And I just want to say one more thing. <laughs> I always want to say one more thing. I haven't been up here that much, y'all, um, is that this Christmas we're going to be doing an angel tree as well out in the, uh, out in the, uh, out in the foyer. So if you'd like to be a part of an angel tree uh, and help children and families, you can pick up an angel in the next couple weeks for that. Our children's church is sponsoring um, a hands, it's hands and head and hands. They are collecting beanies and gloves for a boy's home. So you might say, oh, I don't have a kid in children's church, but you want to help with that, you can bring a beanie and a pair of gloves and also put it in our city reach box that we can partner with a children's home in, in our city. It's going to be great. Our children are really getting excited about it. Would you help us with all of these things this year? I can't wait to give back because that's what it's all about. It's showing kindness. It's showing Jesus' love. It's showing the community that the church really does care. Hallelujah. So we love you today. Thank you for giving us this opportunity uh, to serve back. And so I don't, oh, what are we supposed to do? I think we're supposed to go to 411. We love y'all. Love you guys. 411. 411. Here we go.
Hey Gate family, I'm Chris Clark and this is what's happening in Gate Life. Thank you to everyone who has helped us share contagious joy through Bags by the Bumper. By providing food for families in our community this season, you help share Christ's love to families in need. If you've not had a chance to participate, it's not too late. You can still deliver groceries to the church on Monday or Tuesday this week, or you can make a donation online. Visit thegatechurch.tv forward slash bags to find all the ways you can partner with City Reach to serve our community through Bags by the Bumper. Christmas is almost here and the Gate Church is ready to celebrate. We hope you can join us Sunday, November 22nd after service for pizza and our annual Deck the Halls festivities. This is a great opportunity for our family to come together to decorate the church and prepare to celebrate the hope and joy found in Jesus. Right after this 411, be prepared for a special message from Bishop Tony Miller. I'm Chris Clark, and thank you for joining us today. To stay up to date with everything happening at the Gate Church, you can download our worship guide or text email to 405-241-9559. Hey, Gate Church family, what a great delight it is to have you today to worship with us. We're so thrilled for those of you that are on campus and those of you that are online that you're joining with us today. What an incredible day it is to lift up the name of the Lord. I'm delighted to be able to greet you today. For those of you who have not had a chance to meet, my name is Tony Miller and my wife Kathy and I have the privilege of leading this incredible church and we're so thrilled that you're a part of it today and a part of our worship experience. Let me just take a couple of minutes and talk about a couple of things. I'm so pleased and blessed by all of our outreach guys that are working together. We're scrambling. Over the last two weeks when we were without power uh, due to the ice storm that took place, we weren't able to be in the building, on the property. And so we're sort of scrambling to put together all the stuff for our outreach and these guys have worked overtime. I know you've already heard about that, but just make sure that you not only put your, your heart, your hands, and your efforts to making it happen, uh, we can touch a lot of people this holiday season with your help. And there's going to be a lot of people that's going to need us to step up and bear the burdens of their life. So thank you for the privilege and the joy of leading a church that I know is filled with compassion and has a desire to help other people. Let me tell you about something very, very exciting. I was flying home from Florida on Monday this past week, thinking about our Thanksgiving service, thinking about things that are coming up, because our, our Thanksgiving service that's on Monday night before Thanksgiving, November 23rd, has always been a a special time for us. It's been a time when families come together with their children and we speak a blessing over families and over houses. And I was in my mind trying to think, how do we do in this uh, COVID season where social distancing is necessary? And I realized that we used to anoint people and pray over them. How do we do that and still get what we believe God wants us to do in this season of gratitude? And the Holy Spirit just spoke to me flying on the plane at 35,000 feet on my way home from Florida. And he said, I want you to turn this Thanksgiving service into a healing moment where we call for unity and speak a blessing, not just over families, but over our city. He said, I want you to call your friends, text your friends in the city and invite them to join you. So I got, when I got home, I just got on the phone. I text about 15 or 20 different pastors that I'm in a relationship here in the city. And I said, would you be willing to join us on Monday night, November 23rd, for an expression, really a prophetic declaration to our whole city that we're standing in unity, that we're believing for great days of blessing, protection, healing, that walls of, of division are being broken, and that Jesus is ruling and reigning over Oklahoma City. Within a matter of minutes, seven or eight, nine pastors responded to me right away. Some already had family plans for that week, but many just responded immediately and said, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm going to be there. So here's what I need. I want you to do. I want you to mark Monday night, November 23rd. It's a night when we're not going to do it online. We're going to come in person as well as online, but I'm asking all of you that will to join us right here on the Gate Church campus on November 23rd for our big Thanksgiving service. Other pastors are gonna be here. Some of their leaders will be with them. Some of their congregation may be here with us as well. And we're standing up and we're stepping into the gap for our city. And we're gonna believe God that racial division, strife, misunderstandings, 
illnesses and sickness from viruses that have been spiking. We're going to believe that the healer himself is going to step into the affairs of our city. We're going to have unity. We're going to have a commanded blessing. And God is going to use Oklahoma City as a place to demonstrate his name and his goodness. Will you plan on joining me on November 23rd? I need you to be here. If we don't have very much notice. It's going to be a great time. Thank you so much for putting it in your prayer list, too, and praying. We're believing God for great unity. Wouldn't it be awesome if God uses Oklahoma City? It's just a national testimony of his goodness and his grace to us. Even today, before I did this video, even today, I was on a, a Zoom call. I was asked to speak to 65 national leaders, men that many of you would know and women that you would know. And they said, Bishop, what do we do? And one of the things that came out of that was we understand that a divided nation can never be healed by a divided church. If a divided nation is going to be healed, it's going to take a united church. And our brothers and sisters in this city and the friends that we have in this congregation are not our enemies. They're our partners. They're our brothers. They're our sisters. And we're going to stand together. We're not going to worship at the idols of political preferences. We are going to stand at the kingdom and for the king of glory and see his name made great. So it's going to be an incredible time. Let me ask you to do something today. As we get ready to receive the Lord's tithe and our offering. How many of you know today that sometimes we have to be very intentional? And I know during the ice storm, many of our families were hit. They were without power. Some people five, six, seven. We had some families that were 10 and 14 days without power. They lost all their food. They lost everything in their house and all the expenses that that took. And I recognize that many of our people were in a very difficult situation. I need people today to step up. Our finances took a, took a bit of a hit over those couple of weeks. But I believe that between now and the end of the year, there's not going to be any lack. We're going to make up ground and we're going to receive everything we're supposed to have. As we get ready to give today, here's what I want you to know. Is that God is very intentional about what he does with your seed. He says, when you give, it comes back to you. Watch this. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Here's what he said. I will cause men to give into your bosom. Today, as you honor Jesus with your giving, here's what's going to happen. God's going to cause your boss, people you didn't expect, opportunities for discounts to come. Things are going to come into your life that you didn't know were going to come. God's going to cause men to give back into your bosom. Things are going to come your way. I believe that today. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me just before I came to record this, this today for you. He said this. He said, you tell people that when they do what's on my heart, I will get involved with what's on their heart. And let me tell you what's on the heart of Jesus. What's on the heart of Jesus is that the gospel keeps being preached. That families keep getting good news. And we do that every day, seven days a week from right here at the Gate Church. I want you to prepare today. I know many of you are giving electronically. If you're in the, in, on the campus, you may bring a, a check. You may bring cash. You can go to the kiosks. There's multiple ways to give. I'm going to speak a blessing over your offering. When I finish praying, when we finish bringing our offering. Pastor Jay is going to come and deliver the word today. We're so grateful to hear as we continue our forget not so as we pray today, would you get ready to agree with me? We're not going to forget his benefits. It's going to be amazing what he's done in our life. Father, I thank you today for the privilege of being a giver. I thank you that there's more than enough. Lord, I make an announcement in the heavenlies. There's no deficiencies at the gate church. We are well supplied. We have a sufficiency for every good work. I ask you to bless every man, every woman, every family, every business person today. I thank you that they have everything they need, and I call for an abundance today in our giving. I rebuke the spirit of fear that would tell people they can't be givers. I declare that you're more faithful than anything we even see with our eyes. And we declare you're a good God. Lord, bless businesses and families today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, let's worship God with our giving, and then let's welcome Pastor Jay. Uh, give if you're not giving digitally and you need to come and place an offering envelope in the uh, receptacles here you can do that at this time 
If you're joining us online, you can give uh, digitally. We just thank God for, like Bishop said, your faithful and generous participation. I'm not going to sing a solo, so I'm not sure what the soundtrack is for, but I'm not going to... I'm not going to break out in a solo song. I could do a little dance or something. Um, we do appreciate your giving. I'm going to um, I'm going to have some friends join me on stage for just a minute. And uh, thank you so much. How many love Bishop? Grateful for Bishop. Amen. Appreciate him and Pastor Kathy and their heart, and uh, just continuing to lead us, and we really appreciate your continued engagement. You know, like Bishop said, it's been a difficult time, but as pastors and leaders, we've been encouraged and blessed by your commitment uh, to not let things like uh, COVID or two weeks in a row where this building didn't have any power um, just keep you from being the church. And uh, I think Pastor David said something earlier about it's, it's really the call of the church to choose to press in and not only worship when we're in the middle of a trial or difficulty, but to keep on being on mission. Can you say amen to that? So thank you so much for your continued engagement, your continued giving, your continued commitment to pray and uh, to believe God that uh, nothing changes about our call to be agents of healing and transformation in our city. Amen. So I got some friends that are joining me right now, unless they got arrested back there. We, we, uh, we had a few weeks where we weren't able to gather, and so we got a lot of things we want to tell you. Um, one of the things that's coming up that's really time sensitive um, has to do with our college that we are privileged uh, to have here at the church. And so uh, we like to take a time each semester and, uh, and let people know about uh, what's available at Kingsgate College. And so we have an application deadline that's coming up for spring on December the 1st. And uh, Kelsey's here with some friends. Kelsey uh, helps in Kingsgate College, uh, director of enrollment and recruitment and student life and does all sorts of things. And so you got some friends with us here. We're going to talk about Kingsgate. Yes, I do. And as he said, I do have the privilege of working with Kingsgate and some of these amazing ladies right here. So first, I want to start with on. I'm going to ask you um, this one question. So before you came to Kingsgate, you went to a different university, right? And then you transferred here. How has that experience been for you? How has it been different? Yeah, so um, I went to a secular university for two years, and I think one of the major things that I've noticed, like the differences, is here I'm really challenged. You know, I'm challenged to maybe do something I wouldn't do before, but it's going to benefit me, and I'm growing. Um, and at the secular college, if anything, I was tempted to fall back, you know? So, um, like, in that kind of aspect, that's where I've really um, seen a difference. And with actual Kingsgate, like the classes and everything, um, at the secular college, you know, I'd walk in and I'd take attendance, you know, I'd write my name down and I could leave. And they wouldn't even notice that I wasn't there. Um, but here, um, I walk in, they call me by name, you know, they ask me um, not even how I'm doing in classes, but how I'm doing out of classes, you know. So um, you just feel more, like, appreciated and like you matter, you know, so. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. And Pastor Sade, so before you came to Kingsgate College, you were working as a nurse, um, and when you came here, you felt like you were just supposed to get another degree and further your education in a different way. And so at that time you came, you were working, you were married, you had kids during school. Tell us how your experience was with that. So um, like she said, I was working as a nurse, and so I had worked as a nurse for 10 years, and at that time I was like 30, so that was a long time. And so um, I started having this deep desire to go back to school. And through those 10 years, I started, there's things that I wanted to do, but every time I went to pursue that, like further my nursing career or do like public health, I didn't have peace about it. And so um, the Lord led me to Kingsgate. And uh, during that time when I first went in, I was pretty newly married. I had just had my first daughter. She was six months old and I was transitioning out of being a nurse. And so one thing I was really thankful for is that my professors, my dean, you know, Kelsey, they were aware of that and they were very flexible with me. So it was something that I was able to do during that time. And through Kingsgate, you know, different desires also arose and things I realized I wanted to do. So it's been a great experience. 
That's amazing. And so just kind of what she's saying is no matter what stage of life you're in, if you're working full time and you want to advance um, and just learning in a new area, there's always a way that that can be made possible. Um, and we'll work with you here at Kingsgate. One of the things too that a lot of people don't know is that when you're a student of Kingsgate College, Southeastern works with us where these students as well as all of our other students are able to receive free college credit just for serving right here at the Gate Church. So every semester they get a free three credit college class, which That's is amazing. a really, who doesn't love free college? I don't know. I never got but, that in college. Right. Never it's, a, it's a blessing. So if you are thinking about college, um, we should have some, actually some slides of our degrees if we could show those real quick behind us as we kind of move on. But we have degrees in all things from communication, ministry, business, and this year we actually are launching um, some graduate degrees as well. So whatever, whatever, whatever way you would like to further education, we have those opportunities. Yeah, so as you see those scroll up, we're very excited about our very first, those are still bachelor's degrees, but they're about to show a whole new uh, track of master's degrees and graduate degrees. And we have our first Gate Church master's degree students starting this January. And so we're really excited about that. Um, it's just like everything else in terms of the flexibility and the affordability, and you can do that uh, online no matter how your schedule is. So there's a lot of flexibility. And we've got people that are connecting with Kingsgate from partner churches all over America. And one of the things that Bishop and Pastor Kathy and I have talked about is that we want to make sure that we're serving you. We want to make sure we're serving our gay church family in every way that we can. And so what we're going to do today is right after service, uh, Kelsey and I, as soon as I get done preaching and we get done with service, we're going to be in the back for just a little time of Q&A for you. Uh, and uh, and if I think you've got some uh, scholarship opportunities for people yes. if they apply today. So anybody that comes and applies today here in person or online, we will have an opportunity where you will be entered in to, to win a scholarship for free books for a whole semester. So you don't want to miss on that opportunity. Even if you're kind of wondering, um, come meet us in the back, ask some questions, and we'll even get a free shirt also if you apply. Free merch, free, free merch. books, free college yes. credit for serving in your church. I mean, that's like a, it's like a free day. This is amazing. You guys are really blessed. No wonder you're smiling so big. Isn't that awesome? So give these guys a great big hand. Thank you so much, guys. If you're joining us online, we'd love to talk with you online about Kingsgate. You can apply or inquire for more information at kingsgatecollege.com. So if you're a part of our online audience, we'd love to talk to you about how we can serve you right where you are with Kingsgate as well. How many of you are ready for the word this morning? Amen. Thank you, guys. That is the, the biggest whiteboard on planet Earth right there. So grateful we got good, strong men to help. Amen. Thank you, ladies. Psalm 32. I feel like I'm having to put on a production here. It's like a dramatic production right here. Everybody doing good? If you're joining us online, grab your phone or your Bible. Let's try to get that in the center. I feel like I'll be, my message will be off center if I don't get that right. If you're joining us online, just grab your phone. Hope you can gather your family around the TV or your tablet or your phone or whatever you're watching on. If you're in the sanctuary with us, Psalm chapter 32, we're going to jump right into the Word. I'm hungry, ready to go. I'm hungry for the Word, and in a minute I'll be hungry for lunch. So we're going to jump right into this. We've been in the Psalms, Psalm 16, two weeks ago, if you remember that. Bishop talked about the path to joy. And then uh, last week online, Pastor David shared with us out of Psalm 46. And so today we're in Psalm 32, and we're forgetting not. We're remembering some things. So let's read Psalm 32 together this morning. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. 
I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I want you to notice verse 8 right there, the subject, the, the, the conversation shifts. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. This is God talking now. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with a bit and bridle else they will not come near to you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, you upright in heart. We're going to spend just a few minutes uh, trying to draw from this psalm the word of the Lord to us today. And I want to call this uh, time of teaching surrounded by mercy, surrounded by mercy. Lord, we ask you to open our hearts in a special way right now. Lord, for those of us that are joined online, we just pray that you would meet with us wherever we're, we're watching. And for those of us right here in the sanctuary, we pray that you would open our hearts to hear what you're saying to us. And we trust you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I love the fact that God put it in Bishop's heart um, to spend time in the Psalms. And when we're going through turbulent times and unpredictable times, the Psalms are some of Scripture's greatest gift to us. Because in the Psalms, we get introduced to every range of emotion. So everything that you experience as a human can be found as a Psalm. Have you ever read one of those Psalms, and after you read it, you thought, man, that guy's almost depressed. Like, I'm, I need to pray for the guy who wrote that Psalm, right? Because Psalms are full of things that are up and down and all around, and uh, the Psalms are a gift to us because they teach us how to deal with what we call the interior world of our life. So watch this. Culture is constantly telling us to speed up and ignore our internal life. But Scripture is always encouraging us to pay attention to our interior life. How many of you have found that if you just live life in the world, you'll be tracking along at a pace where you're not even paying attention to what goes on inside of you, but the Psalms uh, come along and say, hey, hold on, let's ask some questions about what's going on inside. So in the Psalms we find questions like, why are you so downcast, O oh my soul? Put your hope in God. So in the Psalms, we find the psalmist asking himself questions about what's going on on the inside of him. And it's not just the Psalms. How many of you know uh, that the older and the wiser you get, you'll find out that it's really smart to pay attention to your interior or your inner life? So there's great wisdom. I'm going to share, uh, I'm going to take several different shots. I think they have some quotes. If you guys can put these quotes up one at a time. Uh, there was a guy named Socrates, and he said, the unexamined life is not worth living. The unexamined life is not worth living. I don't know, maybe they don't have that for the screen, but you can just, they're short, so you can just run with it. There's another guy named St. Augustine, right? And he said, oh God, let me know myself and let me know you. So maybe you don't like Socrates, or you don't like Augustine. Maybe you like uh, the Reformers. John Calvin said, the knowledge of God and of ourselves ca are connected. Without knowledge of self, there's no knowledge of God. Without knowledge of God, there's no knowledge of self. All right, so maybe you're not a fan of Socrates or Augustine or John Calvin, let me give you a more contemporary wise thinker, and he said this, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> that's not Socrates, that's Ice Cube. 
And I think Ice Cube is tapping into some eternal wisdom. Look at your neighbor and say, you better check yourself or you're going to wreck yourself. Ice Cube is letting us know if you don't pay attention to what's going on under the hood of your life, you got to pay attention to that check oil light or you're going to end up on the side of the road broke down, overheated, and needing to call AAA. Are you with me? So the Psalms teach us what it looks like, watch this, not to ignore our interior world, but watch this, but to invite God into our interior world. So through prayer and through the Psalms, that's why in this season I hope that you're taking the Psalms. Because here's the thing, in church we, we, we try to lead people in following Jesus, but here's one thing I've learned. We can't really lead you in following Jesus by changing what you do once a week. So we have this thing in American Christianity where we think, man, if people are serious about Jesus, then they once a week, they make time to get online or come to church, and they do that once a week. But I got news for you. I love you. I want you to come to church once a week. Please come to church every week. But doing something once a week will not change your life. What will change your life is changing what you do every day. And if you start getting into the Psalms every day, and you start praying the Psalms every day, and you start reading the Psalms every day, and you start saying, God, I'm inviting you into my interior world every day. Don't come hear a great message every seven days, but find time in your life to get in the Word of God and get in the presence of God, even if it's 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and say, God, I'm inviting you into this area of my life because I need you to work some grace into my life. I need you to work some transformation. I need some adjustment. I'm going to check myself so that I don't wreck myself. So I want to uh, use this illustration. If you guys can come help me just um, flip the, this whiteboard around because I will, uh, it's the biggest white world in, in America, and so I can't flip it around by myself. So Psalm 32 talks to us about diving down into. So real quick, some context on Psalm 32. It goes along with Psalm 51. You remember Psalm 51 is when David confesses his sin to God. I'm telling you guys, it's literally the biggest whiteboard in the world, I promise. Um, so. So David comes and he confesses and he says, create in me a clean heart, O God. He rejoices in the fact that God's forgiven him of this great sin where, you know, David uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba and he has Bathsheba's husband uh, killed on the front lines of battle and he goes through this terrible uh, thing. In Psalm 32, we see what's going on in David's life before he gets to Psalm 51. And he says, I, I decided to close my interior world off to God. I decided to try to solve this problem by myself. How many of you know there's some problems in your life that you can't solve by yourself? There's some problems in your life, in fact, there's not a single problem in your life that you can actually solve by yourself. If you think you can solve it by yourself, you probably really haven't solved it. Jesus said in John 15, without me, you can do Nothing. So in Jesus' opinion, you can't do anything without his help. So it's a great habit as Christians to begin to develop the habit of saying, Jesus, every day I need you. I need you to drive to work. I need you to be a husband. In order to be the father I need to be, in order to be the employee I need to be, I need you. I abide in you. Every resource that I could possibly need today, it's going to essentially and ultimately come from you, Jesus. And so there's been a lot of, uh, of, of research, and a lot of this is a big iceberg that I had them draw for us. And so you may have seen this before, uh, but in this iceberg, uh, essentially we have we have our external world, and so that's right up here, and that's what you let everyone see. So your actions, your behavior, your attitude, I mean, your attitudes that you allow people to see, and then you have attitudes that you don't allow people to see. How many of you know I'm telling the truth? Attitudes is on the line. How many of you know you got some attitudes you let people see, and you got some attitudes you don't let people see? And so your words, though, that you speak your behavior and your actions are all things a part of your external world. And if we're not careful, like I said, and we allow society to, to get us to live at a certain pace, we'll just live up here. 
And we just live up here and we just wake up and the words that come to our mind are the words that we use and the actions. And then how many of you know sometimes our actions start turning into reactions? And then I begin living a reactive life so that I'm actually just reacting to what came up on Facebook this morning when I woke up. I'm not living my life. Facebook's living my life. I'm not living my life. Whoever just texted me last is living my life. I'm preaching good right now. So that I'm not driving the ship of my life, but it's being driven by things that come into my external world, and I just keep reacting to them. And so uh, as, we, as we begin to understand, there's more to my life, much more down here than there ever is up here. So down here I've got thoughts and feelings and emotions. And then deeper still, I have desires and longings that I don't even know are there. And how many of you found out that you've lived long enough to realize that before long, if you don't pay attention to it, all this stuff just kind of floats to the top? And then in moments when the world goes crazy and the school changes their mind and your kids are now at home, they were supposed to be at school, they changed their mind four times, and now my kid's running around, they're on Zoom trying to do sixth grade math. I can't even do sixth grade math. All of a sudden, if this thing starts boiling to the top, then it starts popping up up here and somebody asks me a simple question at work and I go off on them. Or my wife asks me why that dirty sock is on the floor and I lose my ever-loving mind. I'm just relaying things that have never happened to me in my life that other people I've heard about have had issues with. So, so how many of you know that the quality, watch this, the quality of my external world will always be proportionate to the health of my internal world? And David is in Psalm 32, and he's like, I closed myself off, and I felt like my bones were turning to powder. Have you ever been to the doctor? I've been to the doctor. And when I started getting closer to 40, the doctor started asking me questions he never asked me before. It used to be like, you're 25, take your blood, your blood pressure, your whatever, check, bam, you're done, your temperature's good, you're healthy, go. Doctor started asking me questions when I started going, he started asking me things like, are you very stressed? I was like, dude, you're a medical doctor, not a psychologist. Why do you need to know whether I'm stressed or not? I'm here to find out how my physical health is. But the doctor understands something. The doctor understands that if this is experiencing stress, then my body will begin to exemplify the stress that's going on in my world. So he can't really take care of this without helping me think about this. Doctors are smart enough to know that they need to ask some questions because what's going on in the unseen realm of my life is actually showing up in my body, and it's showing up in the seen parts of my life so that I have to begin to learn how to become a healthy human from the inside out. Now, what the doctor may or may not know is that if I can ever learn how to stop ignoring this, and if I can ever learn how to open this, then I give God an opportunity to introduce things into my inner world. This is what the Bible talks about, about being transformed by the renewing of your mind and not being conformed to the pattern of the world. So you're either being shaped by culture or you're being shaped by Christ. Christ lives down in here in the unseen realm of your life, but he doesn't do things without your permission. Y'all, y'all don't miss that. Jesus is Lord of the universe. We heard it today. He's Lord of all. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus in Psalm 2, when the kings of the earth gather together, when the G8 summit takes place and they try to figure out how they're going to run the world, the Bible says the king of heavens laughs at them. 
It just gets a chuckle out of all of the global and international policy meetings that take place. But guess what? That king of glory lives in your heart, but he won't do a thing until you say, have your way in me. Until you say, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. And as soon as you do, he says, I've been waiting on you to do that. I'd love to heal that. I'd love to judge. I'd love to correct that. I'd love to redeem that and restore it. So, so the psalmist begins to teach us how to open up our lives, and we can learn by David's roller coaster ride that he went through. So, uh, so uh, you know, First John, uh, Third John, verse two says, "Beloved, I want you to prosper and be in health, even as." Everybody say, "Even as." Even as your soul prospers. One of the greatest things we can do as a church, one of the greatest things we can do as Christians is to, is to remind you, to encourage you, to say, how is your soul doing? Not how is your salary doing? Not, not how is your happiness, not how is your job promotion, not how is your 401k doing, how is your soul doing. Amen? So here in this series, as we remember and we forget not. So in verse number 8, an interesting thing happens. David opens up his soul to the Lord, and for the first seven verses, all we get is David. And it's David, and this is, I feel like a heavy hand is on me. I feel crushed. I feel under the burden. And then David says, but I opened up my soul to God, and I confessed my sin and my transgression to him. And the next thing you know, God starts talking. And God starts saying, hey, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to guide you, and I'm going to instruct you, and I'm going to surround you. So the conversation begins to shift when David opens up his heart. How many of you know that God wants to get involved in your internal dialogue? Now, I did a little research. Uh, watch this. Your internal dialogue is, is pretty interesting. It occurs ten times faster than your normal speech. What do you mean, my internal dialogue, Pastor Jay? What I mean is that conversation that you're having in your head right now. That one that never stops. The one that thinks, how long is he going to preach for? And what are we going to have for lunch right now? And is my wife still mad at me? And what are our kids doing right now? And who just texted me? That conversation, that one right there. The one that it goes on and on and on in your head. Watch this, 4,000 words per minute. 4,000 words per minute. Now, I know some people that can almost talk 4,000 words a minute, but, but they can't, okay? That's 10 times faster than normal speech. Why? Because you don't need your tongue or your vocal cords or your lips, and you know what you're saying before you say it, so you don't even finish sentences in your head. And you just, you just ramp that thing up. 4,000 words a minute, 10 times faster than normal conversation. But watch this. When you let Scripture and the Holy Spirit slow you down, and then you say, God, here I am in your presence. Then God says, can I get involved in that conversation? Can I remind you of some things? Because all that conversation is about how stressed out you are at work right now, how you're not meeting your numbers, whether your boss is going to let you go at the end of the year, whether you're going to get a bonus or not. But can God get in that conversation and say, I want to be your provider. I want to be your father. You have no need to worry. Jesus said, worry not about what you'll wear or the clothes that you'll get, but your father in heaven is watching. God says, I would like to be a part of the internal dialogue dialogue of your life. Can I tell you what I think about that? And so God gets involved in this internal dialogue that David is happening, and he begins to change the conversation. So I want to give you three things real quickly this morning that Psalm 32 teaches us, that when we slow down, God gets involved in the conversation. And I think these things will be really, really pertinent to the moment that we're in right now. The first thing that we notice is that David is consumed with the idea of protection. All David is worried about is the preservation of his life. But did you notice what God starts talking about when God in verse 8 begins to speak? He says, I'll guide you and direct you. So watch this. Number one. When 
I feel like I need protection, God is actually offering me direction. David was in the middle of a storm of his life that he thought the storm was coming to destroy him. But when he got God involved in the conversation, he found out the storm wasn't going to destroy him. The storm was actually going to direct him. And I think we're in the middle of a storm right now in our nation and in the world. And if we don't have the mind of Christ, we'll believe that all we need is protection when God's actually saying, hey, if you'll let me, that wind from that storm that you thought was going to blow your house down, I'm actually going to take the force of that wind and use it to propel you into the next thing that I have for you. Don't be afraid of a storm. God can use it to direct you. God can use it to rearrange you. God can use it to reprioritize some things in your life. The Apostle Paul found himself on a boat in Acts 26 as a prisoner on his way to Rome. And the Apostle Paul was a disciple of Jesus. And a great storm came against that boat. And I just imagine that the Apostle Paul probably had to give it a shot because he had heard about Jesus. When Jesus was on a boat and the storm came, Jesus said, peace, be still. If I'm Paul, I'm giving the peace be still trick a try. I mean, I'm going to give it a whirl. But how many of you have ever said peace be still to a storm in your life and it kept on raging? Sometimes it calms down, but sometimes it doesn't. But what you can know is that anytime God doesn't calm the storm, God will use the storm to get you where God wants you to go. The storm might look scary, but it's also a vehicle in God's hand. Paul was on his way to Rome, had no plans to stop at Malta, but God said, Paul, I need you to take a stop at Malta, and the only way I know how to get you there is to send a storm your way so that you'll make a stop you hadn't planned on your itinerary. Just rest in me. And he told Paul, he said, that storm is going to take the ship, but it won't take your life. How many of you know there might be some things that fall apart in your life, but you won't fall apart as long as you're connected to Jesus. This ship might not make it. This job might not make it. This season may not make it. This relationship may not make it. But at the end of this storm, I'm still going to be standing because my life belongs to Jesus. I might be sick, I might be crippled, I might be depressed, I might be at the bottom, but if Jesus doesn't say, it's time for me to go home and be with Jesus, no storm, no sickness, no height, no depth, no principality, no power, no angel, no demon, nothing shall by any means be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so he says, don't be afraid of the storm. Don't be afraid of what seems like is coming to destroy you. God can use it to direct you. Number two, I want to tell you that we get, we get to determine the method of our movement. We get to determine the method of our movement. What I mean by that is that God tells him, I want to guide you and direct you. And then God gets real raw with the psalmist. And here's the message. This would be a great title for my message, but I wanted to preach about it a little bit more than this. But the title for my message would be, Don't Be a Mule. I could go with a few permutations of that title, but I won't do that. So we'll just stick with Don't Be a Mule. Don't Be a Mule. So God says to the psalmist, I'm trying... Why are you going through something that feels like it's destroying me? God says, because I'm trying to get you to a different place. That's why you're going through what you're going through. I'm trying to move you to a different, I will guide you. I will direct you. I will surround you. I will get you where I want you to go. Don't be like a mule. What does being like a mule have to do with me? Well, here's the thing. If you're a sheep, then just the sound of the shepherd's voice will get the sheep to move. 
But if you're a mule, when you hear the shepherd's voice, you just keep on eating that grass that's right there in front of you. And then the shepherd says, come on, boy. I said, let's move. And, the, and you know what it takes to move a mule? A storm. It takes a storm to move a mule. It takes a storm to get a mule's attention. And God says, I'm trying to move you, but you get to decide what is the external circumstance and the external factors that are going to be the force that moves you. There may be a storm coming, but if you'll pay attention to the still, small voice and respond to it, even when things are going well, you might save yourself from some pain. But God is committed to to getting you where he wants you to get. So he'll start with a still small voice. And if that doesn't work, he'll send a friend. And if that don't work, he'll send a pastor. And if that don't work, he'll send a problem. And if that don't work, he'll send another problem. And if that don't work, he'll upside down your whole world because God says you can't stay here any longer. I've got something new for you. So I feel like we're all in this boat in 2020, and I don't, can't tell you what everything's happening. I can't explain everything, but what I, what I, the only conclusion I can come to is that there's some new places God wants to get us into. And, and anytime things get shaken up in my life, I know that God is allowing things to be shaken up because he wants to get me to the place that he wants me to be. If... It takes a storm to get you to draw near to God, you're being like a mule. If a still small voice can move you toward God, then you're being like a sheep. The Sunday school lesson today, ladies and gentlemen, is be like a sheep. Don't be like a mule. Now just look at that person that you're married to sitting beside you right now and just say these words to him under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, in the presence of God, in the house of God. Just look at him and say, don't be a mule, honey. Just don't be a mule. <laughs> that did not help many marriages today. <clears throat> number three, number three, the last thing I want to tell you this morning. Are you learning anything? Number three, this psalm tells us that when we, when we open up, our inner life to God. He surpasses our need. I want you to catch this. I'm going to slow down right here. He surpasses our need, and he surrounds us with mercy. He surpasses our need. David thought, I need, I don't know what I need. I need somebody to get this thing off of me. Pastor Jordan, can you just come help me? David said, I need somebody to get this thing off of me, and and God says, yeah, I can get that off of you, but I also want to give you something more than that. How many of you found out that if you just deal with God based on your needs, you're going to miss out on a lot of God's purpose for your life? See, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else that you need will be taken care of. So needs are not the primary avenue of my relationship with God. God says, what needs? Are you kidding? Like a refrigerator? Are you kidding? God says, I own a thousand, a cattle on a thousand hill. I don't need, I don't have no problem getting you what you need. It's your needs aren't the issue. That's what's weighing you down. What I want is your heart. And if you give me your heart, then I'll take care of all your needs with great joy. But you're over there stressed out about your needs, and I'm trying to talk to you about your heart. And so in, in, even in terms of how we understand salvation, the most Christians' understanding of salvation has only to do with our needs. And so we say things like this, I need forgiveness. Because we know we've done some stuff wrong. So we think that salvation is forgiveness. Can I tell you that salvation is much more than forgiveness? And if the only way you understand salvation is forgiveness, you're missing out on so much of what Jesus gave his life to bring you into. So that if you think that all I need is God to do is to forgive me, then God says, you can be forgiven. That's not an issue. But I've got so much more for you. And until you invite me into the internal conversation of your life, I can't open up your eyes to everything else I want to do in your life. And so... 
Here's, here's David. Pastor Jordan's going to be David, and he's, he's just in a miserable place. He's all hunched over. He's like hunched over. His bones are drying up. One translation said, my bones became powder. So I want you to like, I mean, just get down there. Just like, it's just a weight of the world's on him. And so, so yeah, that's better. So, so I'm going to be God. And so you just stay right down there, and here comes God. And so the Bible talks about God's presence like a hovering presence, right? And so, so here's what I want you to see. I think you're going to see something you, you at least I, I hadn't seen before, so I'm hoping maybe you've seen it before. You could email me. But it, God's hovering over David, right? And David says, I feel like God's heavy hand is on me, and my bones are drying up, and I'm crushed, and all this pressure, right? And, but, but here's God. God's hovering over him in his presence. And so, so watch this. The psalm gives us a key. Because the psalm never says that God changes. The psalm says David changed. He said, I was closed off to you, and I felt like you were coming to crush me. I felt like you were mad because of what I did. And I felt like your heavy hand was upon me. But when I confessed my sin to you and turned around, I found myself surrounded by mercy. <laughs> David said, while I was closed off, I thought God was after me. But when I opened up, I found out God was for me. I found out God wanted to flood my life with mercy. And sur I found out God didn't even want an explanation. God didn't even want me to go through that. He just said, I've been waiting for you to invite me in to this area of your life. And I don't have judgment for you. I've got mercy for you. But as long as you're close closed off to me, you'll be confused about what the presence of God is doing in your life. Watch this. Watch this. The cross doesn't change God's mind about us. The cross doesn't change God's mind about us. The cross changes our mind about God. Did y'all get that? So, what Jesus and his revelation of who God is, it doesn't mean that he gets God in a good mood. It means that he gets me in a place of understanding what God is really like. And I open myself up so that in areas of my life, and here's what I want you to see. There are areas of your life, maybe certain areas are going well. But watch this. There's some areas of your life where you feel like if God could, he'd slap you. Where if God could... He'd harm you. Can I give you some good news this morning? There's no area of your life where God's looking to harm you. The only thing God's looking to do is heal you today. Can you say amen to that? Can you give God thanks for that? All God wants to do is heal you. There was a, an early church father who talked about Jesus in this way. And he talked about the reign and the rule of Jesus. And then he talked about the judgment of Jesus. And I want to see if I can just drop this seed in your mind. But he said it's a therapeutic judgment. That means that whatever Jesus comes to correct in my life, he's always coming as a physician. He's always coming to heal and restore. So there's never a moment in my life where I need to be afraid to open up and say, God, would you come in to this place? See, I learned all my life, and I'm getting ready to close. You can come to the keyboard if you want to. I learned all my life. I was taught this as a kid, and lots of church people are, that God is too holy to look upon sin. That God is too holy to be in the presence of sin. So if sin is in my life, then somehow God is having to get some distance between him and that sin in my life. And, I, and so every time I had sin in my life, I always was, was perplexed because I thought, I want God close to me, but this is here, and i got to get this dealt with. Do you see the dilemma? God can't get close to this. i got to get this dealt with. 
But I can't deal with this. Can I give you a message? You can't deal with the sin in your life. You're not equipped for that. That's what Jesus does. So here comes Jesus. Everybody says, what is God like? And you know where Jesus is? Hanging out with sinners. Running around with people who are sinning all the time. And Jesus subverts this whole idea and lets us know that it's not that God can't stand to be in the presence of sin. God is not intimidated by sin. God is not afraid that he's going to get contaminated by sin. God is not nervous about sinful humanity. God is Lord and King of all. So the reality is is that that's a lie to keep me distancing myself from God when I need God more than I've ever needed him. And the truth of the matter is, it's not that God can't stand the presence of sin. The truth of the matter is, sin can't stand the presence of God. Y'all didn't get that. I said it's not that sin. So that means David in Psalm 32 says, I got this sin that was killing me. And as soon as I opened my life up to God, the healing powerful presence of God, the mercy of God flooded that area of my life, and now it's full of God, and the sin couldn't stay. But as long as I was believing this lie that I had to be over here by myself trying to sort this thing out till I could feel like I was good enough to get into the presence of God, then I was in this dilemma, and my bones were drying up. But Psalm 32 tells us all you've got to do is quit worrying about that dilemma. Quit worrying about whatever was going on and just say, God, I can't do this without you. Would you surround me with your mercy? Would you flood me with your mercy? I need you more than anything. And David says, if we remember, are you with me, church? If we remember what God is really like, if we remember what Jesus really teaches us, then in moments of difficulty, in moments where we have areas of our life that bring us shame, we'll find ways to say, God, that's the area more than anything. God, I don't need to fake it to you. I don't need you to tell you about how every part of my life that's going good. You already know the good, the bad, and the ugly. God, I need to talk to you about this area that I don't talk to anybody else about. That thing that you know and I know that nobody else knows. God, that's where I need your mercy. And God never, listen to me, church, listen to me, listen to me online. God never, never looks at you. He says, man, I can't believe you got that going on. God never looks at you in condemnation. Here's how much condemnation there is. There is therefore now no condemnation. Why? Because of Jesus. So come on, church. I want to invite you to just stand to your feet. Let's just begin to open up our souls for a minute. Can we do that? Can we just begin to open up our souls in the presence of God and thank Him for His mercy this morning? Wherever you're watching from online right now, would you just lift your hands toward heaven and would you just begin to thank God for His mercy? Thank Him, Lord, that as we open up our souls to you today, you flood us and surround us with mercy. God, we want to remember your mercy. We want to remember your goodness. God, we want to remember your healing today. So, Lord, we open up our hearts. We open up our mouths. Come on, just open your mouth and begin to give God thanks. I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded. Come on, by just ask God to surround you right now with mercy. Yes, yes. Oh, oh, this is how I fight my.
want us to do something. I'm just asking the presence of God just to fill your heart and your space right now. But I just believe that, that what that song says, here's what I hear the Holy Spirit just asking some people today. So would you let me fight that battle for you? See, I feel so strongly in my heart right now. There's so many people that are under the sound of my voice that you've been fighting battles and you're tired. You're tired of fighting that battle. And, and just be honest, you're not winning. And, and I think Jesus is just saying, hey, can I step in and fight that battle for you? Because I've already won that battle. <laughs> Jesus, said, Jesus said, there's no question about, I've already beat that and you're trying to beat it. And if you just let me step in, I'd love to fight that for you. And this isn't about performance. This is about freedom. And all you got to do is just say, Jesus, fight that battle for me and let me rest in your love today. Let me rest in your mercy today. And so I just want them to kind of shift into something, and I want to give you some space right now because I believe God wants some space to operate in your life. And we're going to dismiss our service and let people go that need to go. And, and if you want information about Kingsgate, we'll be in the back, backs of the bumper and all that. But I don't want to do that without giving people an opportunity. If you want to come down front here and just find a space at the altar, if you want to make a space right there where you're sitting. But I just believe that I wouldn't be doing what I was assigned to do if I didn't encourage you to take a few minutes right now and just open up your soul and say, Jesus, come fight these battles. Jesus, come bring your mercy. Jesus, come bring your healing. That's all you have to do. And I promise you this, if you do it, you're going to feel him coming. You're going to know he's with you. And you're going to know we're here to help you. So, Father, we just say as a congregation of people, as a family today, we say that in Oklahoma City and at the Gate Church, our confidence is in the fact that you're fighting our battles for us. Lord, you are our victor. And so, Lord, I pray that every dark force and demonic voice that is having place in any heart and soul is going to be drowned out by the voice of mercy today going to be drowned out by the voice of love so we open ourselves to you and we say come lord jesus right here into our interior lives right now into our souls and our hearts and we give you thanks for it in jesus name now if you need to go you're free to go but i encourage you to take just a few minutes and make space in the presence of god to today as we close our service god bless you We trust you, we trust you, we give it all of us to you.